told me that uh, this verse had a special meaning to him now that he had retired. He said he had to get out of the house. I'm not sure whether his wife didn't want him in the house or whether he was spending too much time with his wife, but this was his favorite verse, this one phrase, I'm going fishing. And you know, I got to thinking about that as I was doing the study this week. And I decided that um, I have a confession to make to you. Uh, but before I do that, let me sort of set the stage for what I'm going to speak to you about in my confession. Uh, in July 8th of 2008, Gail and I left Korea. We left to return to the States. And after, uh, oh, about one year and a half of deputation, in case you don't know what deputation is, it's when a missionary is assigned to different areas and they go from church to church every Sunday speaking about their work and what they've done. And we had about a year and a half of deputation from 2008 to about 2009, and then we were officially retired. You know, we were fortunate. During our deputation service, I usually spoke about the great group of the Korean church. I often shared about our Nazarene University and what great fun and spiritual uplifting experience it, it had been. I share about Jesus, about students accepting Jesus Christ. I shared about those students who were called into the ministry. They start out as real rascals, real troublemakers, but you know they become really pastors of our some of our largest churches in the Church of the Nazarene here in Korea these days. I guess you gotta have a little bit of fire or something there to to develop into that kind of a person. He developed slide presentations to show how God was working in this great nation of Korea. I also showed the result of God's grace in the faces of the beautiful Korean people. But, you know, thanks to the growth of the Korean church and the acceptance of Jesus Christ in the hearts and lives of the Korean people, we had a fantastic story to tell each church that we visited. A story of grace and God's mercy to all. And so much so that our listeners were really encouraged and pledged themselves to a, a deeper, more abiding experience in Jesus Christ. So your victories were victories for our listeners. Well, even up to today, we're called out different Sundays to share how God is moving, not only in Korea, but many other parts of the world. I look, had to look up new information about our church growth in the different nations. I had traveled much during the last three years I was in Korea. Dr. Ian had become president. I had resigned. To finish my remaining time as a missionary, I was appointed to go visit all the nations in Asia and uh, do some coordinating and evaluating and some of those things at our schools. It was a real sacrifice, I'll tell you. Went from one beautiful Asian nation to another, going down to Australia and being on the Golden uh, beach, uh, beach area down there, going to Thailand. It was just a, a real sacrifice. But as I visited our schools, I was really impressed. All these young people studying, many of them were preparing young, uh, these young people for the ministry. And God's great grace was working in all these nations. So you know, we had so much to share with the churches. Of course, this final assignment 
gave us so much more to share. Then for the last two years, I visited each of our schools in America. My job was to uh, set up a booth and try to explain to young people like yourself about the amazing ministry of opportunity in what we call creative nations. That's areas where they do not allow, allow a person to come in as a missionary. So we have a creative nation. And uh, we were able to select and send to our headquarters the names and pictures and the applications of many, many young people. Just an exciting thing to do. You know, the whole emphasis was to go as sort of a missionary type teacher, often related to the teaching of English. And in our magazines, these people would come out with their picture, going to a creative nation, is the way it was described. They couldn't even say where they were going. Now, my wife, Gail, Gail Pesh, for some of you, uh, has served down through the years, helping these young people to be placed in not only Korea, but in many of the other areas. Uh, and that's her service to God, her service to the church. I'm curious, how many here have been contacted by Gail, Gail Patch, and have ended up here? Yeah, quite a few, okay. In fact, when I first came back to Korea, only Gail, people only knew Gail Patch. I was sort of rebuffed at that. Oh, you're Gail's husband. You know, uh, a little tidbit of history for you. You know who has taught the longest in Nazarene University as a full-time professor? My wife, Kim. Just a little tidbit of history. You know, it's not recorded anywhere, but from 1974 to 2008, he was the longest full-time professor that KNU has had. So uh, there once again, she holds all the historical records. But you know, in this process, just recently, as I've been thinking about going fishing, I like to fish, but I don't like to go fishing when I don't catch any. You know, it, it sort of turns me off. That's why I take a book or something when I'm fishing. Maybe that's why I don't catch any fish. I'm not watching the line properly. <laughs> now, so back to my confession. Over the last uh, couple years, I have, uh, as they say, gone fishing. I've been, I believe, and my confession is, I believe I've been going fishing too much. Oh, not actually fishing. But you know, I've sort of spent a lot of time, my daughter has a, a large lawn, and that grass grows so fast. And I've spent a lot of, most of my time mowing the lawn. And we, she has a whole bunch of trees, and some of them need cut down. And I've got a chainsaw, and I'm cutting down trees and piling them up and splitting the logs so she can use the logs in her fireplace. No, in fact, I was gradually retiring from using my God given. Severely, severely limited, of course, talents for other than the purpose of winning souls and pointing them to Jesus Christ. That is my confession this morning. Then, 
God sent Josh and Peter to harass me at my home in Cleveland. Josh wrote and told me, will you come over here for a while? And I thought, whoa, you know, I'm fishing. And then Peter got on the horn too. And Peter kept telling me that uh, we could set this up or set that up and why don't you come over? You know, it woke me up. I took a hard look at Bill. <coughs> and of course I love Korea. I mean, I could uh, just live here permanently. <coughs> My function that I was doing over the last two years, I had to confess. And I say thank you to you people for inviting me. I say thank you to our rehab, said to Josh, thank you. Talk to Pete, thank you. But I must confess, it's so easy living in such a way to point others to Jesus Christ. Our scripture today tells us about a disciple who went through this kind of awakening. I call my friend, good old Apostle Peter. What a man. You know, I've always had these uh, as I study and read about people, I have these visions. I see him as a shorter, wiry, uh, not very pretty kind of a guy. Very, very strong. You might say sort of bullheaded, you know, not, he knows which way he wants to go for sure. a real puppy. But do you remember when the, the little girl says to him, Ah, oh, you're one of those guys, aren't you? You're one of those Jesus followers. And as Jesus had predicted, had prophesied through Peter himself, he denied Jesus, his Lord, three times. Remember as Jesus was being led out to the cross, Peter says, divide me. And Peter is resting to remember what he has done. He goes out and he cries and weeps. Bitter tears, the Bible tells us. You would think that maybe Peter lost his place in his, his as an apostle. But yet, it tells us also that, you know, Jesus told the disciples to go out and he would meet them. And what did he say? Oh, by the way, tell Peter. Jesus forgave and brought him back into the fold. Peter had repented. today, in this lesson, once again, Peter, who loves his Lord, decides to do what? Hmm? Go fishing. He says, let's go, I'm going fishing. And he's such a leader of the disciples, everyone says, okay, if you're going fishing, I'm going along. You know, if you think about it, Peter and these other disciples, just about three short years before that, had given up their boat, given up their nets. They were to become fishers of men, Jesus told them. But uh, 
Peter said, I'm going fishing. And everyone followed along. Wouldn't it have been great if someone had said at that time, hey, I'm going to carry my Jesus full of spirit. But can you imagine what happened? They went fishing, and they fished all night long and didn't catch one fish. Now, people, it's not you and me running out on a given day going fishing. These are professional fishermen. They know where the fish are. They know all these things, but they fish all night long. And not one little fish. Can you imagine what they were thinking? You know, Jesus had been crucified. He rose again. But, you know, I sort of think that they were thinking if they could only see him again. They could only talk to him. Things would be different. I'm sure they thought, oh, how could that ever happen? He can't even fish anymore. We can't follow Jesus correctly. We can't fish anymore. Not one fish all night long. I believe they were stressed out, emotionally confused, and ready to give up and quit. Forget all about it. The three years they had been with Jesus. But they come and they see a man on the shore. You see, Jesus came. Jesus came. To them. And we know that when Jesus comes, tears, fear, heartache are gone. When Jesus comes, Jesus has come to us. Jesus proved to be a masterful fisherman. They caught so many fish, 153 large fish, they couldn't even get them into the boat. John looks out to see who that man is on the shore. He says, it's the Lord. And the beautiful part of this is that it is Peter, this guy who's going fishing, this guy who's leading the rest of the group almost astray. He sees the Lord he loves. He doesn't take time to gradually row the boats in. He jumps into the water. He swims to shore because of his Lord. He loves his Lord. Peter loves Jesus more than anything. I feel his failures came because he didn't know himself. He didn't understand that his leadership was misdirecting this group of disciples. How do you love the Lord? He was ready, in one sense, he was ready to die for Jesus. But not knowing why and for what reason. But Peter, this rough old fisherman, loves his Lord. You know, the other disciples came in more slowly. They uh, rode the boats in, that type of thing, bringing the nets towards the shore, and they saw breakfast prepared. Who there before they got there. You see, Peter's Lord had prepared the breakfast for them. He not only came, he was there to meet their needs, their physical needs. You know, the Bible tells us that the, the disciples didn't ask any questions. Here Jesus gave them this warm breakfast. No one asked, who is he? They knew he was, it was Jesus. And then the Lord Jesus says, 
You know, we're running out of fish. We need more fish. And who is it that jumps back into the water, grabs the boats, over to where the boats are, pulls the fish whole way into shore? Not he and the disciples, but Peter. Peter loved his Lord. He was ready to act at the first command. Peter alone seems to hold this big net for the big fish, 153. You know, after breakfast, I think it's sort of implied that uh, maybe the disciples were a little uneasy. You know, just a few short years ago, they had stopped their professional fishing. And, you know, during those three years, Jesus was sent them out two by two, you remember? And they came back rejoicing that even the demons obeyed him. Oh, they had been with Jesus. And it reflected in their lives and what they did. But they had gone fishing. I wonder if maybe among them they weren't whispering. I wonder what he's doing. I wonder if he's going to all us out. Is he going to criticize us? And you hear the whisper? Oh, what's that? What's Jesus saying to Peter? The Lord the Jesus that Peter loved so much was asking Peter, do you love me more than these? Now the Bible doesn't tell us what these are. We often think, well, it's the 153 fish. It's the profession of fishing. Does good old Peter love Jesus more than these fish? Or these could have possibly have meant the disciples that Peter was the leader of. In other words, Peter, do you love these men and your leadership more than these? We don't know, do we? But we do know by the third time, there was a difference. Peter understood what his Lord had asked. So he replies, yes, Lord, you know but I love you. Now, let me pause for a moment here in this story. Has your wife or your husband ever asked, do you love me? Hmm? Has that ever happened to you? You know, I hate to be a little critical on husbands, but as husbands, this kind of thing really confuses us. I mean, after all, what kind of question is that? Hmm? What kind of question? You know, one thing I've learned after 50 years, I'm probably limited to one thing, I'm a slow learner. I have learned never to say to questions like that, of course, don't be silly. Most men like that who are so clueless will probably spend two or three games, uh, days getting out of the hole they just dug themselves into. They're little love games, but in reality, there's no game to it. We didn't ask, answer the real question. Let me, let me put it a little more clearly about this relationship. Have you ever gone to an outdoor steak cookout where the steaks are, huh? this is before lunch, I'm sorry, but the steaks are real big and juicy 
and God is perfectly. A husband going through this experience probably looks at the state, smacks their lips, and quickly, succinctly, down with it. Eats it. His only thought is, my dad would think, I'm sure, I wonder if this won't be enough for a second. And then he moves on. Now the wife, if you think about her, shows you the difference in, maybe it's from the genes, I'm not sure. She will very carefully and slowly eat her steak. I'll probably smack her lips too because it's really good tasting. Uh, she might spend some time contemplating how well it is cooked, the temperature of the meat, how juicy it is, and maybe take some time to think, well, man, I don't know if I've ever had this good of a steak before. Thinking through all these different things about a steak, where Peter, I'm sure, would have been, have eaten it and be done with it. First and foremost, another feet, like me. You see, the question, do you love me? Has all the context, all the understanding of that woman eating her steak. It's not something we glibly do. Or the women glibly do. They want to savor it to the last minute. They recognize all the importance of the question. Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? Three times. Why? Was it to remind Peter that he had denied, it, denied Jesus three times? Was it to help Peter to define his love and what it really means? Or maybe was it to help Peter to understand that his love of his Lord was a mandate to be a fisherman for mankind, for people. Peter understood finally that whatever it meant, and what I'm suggesting is this is the wife contemplating the steak. Peter finally understands that the question demands his whole response. He must commit himself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in his life. He must, he realizes that Jesus knows all. And Peter, probably his voice changed because he's been hurt. says to the Lord, Jesus, you know all about me. You know my heart. I'm sure it was sort of a, a tone of confession, a tone of more of a meekness to his voice because it demanded and he knew that when he responded. And not only his life, but all the lives, the fellow lives of the disciples. Now, there's one other interesting aspect I like. This is a beautiful story. I could probably go so too. I have not many notes at home. Um, Jesus. Um, 
shows his great trust in Peter. Do you understand what he does there when he talks to Peter about how he's going to die? He tells Peter he's going to die an awful death, putting his blessing. He was convinced Peter loved his Lord. He loved him with all his heart. And even though he was a rough fisherman, he was going to follow the Lord. Jesus was now no longer afraid to tell Peter, hey, follow me, and you're going to die an awful death. History has it that Peter was crucified, only upside down. You know why? According to history, Peter, the rough old fisherman, so loved his Lord, he felt it would be dishonor for him to be crucified upright. He thought he was crucified upside down. You see, Peter loved his Lord. He became a fantastic fisherman of man. You know, to bring this closer to us, where are we in our lives? I've already confessed that uh, over the last two years, I believe that I've been fishing. But where are we? Have we fallen into the trap of taking uh, opportunities and that type of thing, avoiding them, and using our time for fishing or whatever? You know, the Peter and the disciples three years early had given up their boats, their nets, to follow Jesus. I wonder about us. Are there things in your past, in my past, that we've given up for Jesus to fully serve him, to show like Peter how much we love him? Are there things like that that we have done? Maybe to this morning, we're planning on going fishing. Many of you young people have come here planning to, as you put in, I often saw a lot of your statements about your faith and your goals. You've uh, said you wanted to come here and teach, share your faith. I wonder, are you going fishing? Are we still sharing our faith? You have used the dreams to express them so well. I wonder, are you still we still dreaming for the Lord. Professor, worker. are we uh, fishing for fish? Or are we uh, passionately, intentionally fishing for men? You know, for all of us, our actions our behavior, our loyalty to sign contracts and promises represent your base when you're fishing for men. You know, I, I pray sincerely and pray this morning that the bait you're using is, if you're using worms, you know, they're on that hook and they're 
squirming around and you're attracting the attention of men around you. The big splash. Your dreams are real. Your focus is accurate. Your old Peter, he loves you. Probably for the last time in his life, he made a big, big error and decided to go fishing. I made a confession to you this morning, sincerely. I confessed that uh, the last two years, my focus has been poor. My base I'm using probably was a minimum of two years old. It hung in the water. Even a stick fish might not want to bite it. I really thank all of you, most of all God, for renewing his challenge to me to be a Fisherman of men, my bait fresh, my focus accurately, looking up and not down. Is that your prayer? I pray that it is. Peter, that old fisherman, mangy character that he was, he became one of the great church leaders. He became a great fisherman of men. Does he realize how deeply his love of Jesus, what that love meant for himself? I pray you're a fisherman for men. I pray that God is alive and strong. You see, that Jesus living within becomes our base. He's the attraction for us in our inner lives. Peter's going to come and pray for us, but as he comes, I'd like each of us to bow our heads, shut our eyes. Now, in your own mind, looking around, would you pray? Peter's prayer? Yes, Lord. I know you know all about me. I love you, Lord. Would you take a moment, please? Father, as we...